Okay, as you rose this morning and you came to church, can I ask you, what did you expect this morning's sermon to be about? As you came uh, to LCPs, what did you think that we'd be preaching on this morning? If you think about it, come on. Uh, it's the first Sunday of the new year. You, if you're honest, you expected a sermon about New Year's resolutions. You at least expected your minister to mention New Year's resolutions. Yeah, come on, you did. I think you did. A sermon maybe about prayer. How we all have to turn over a new leaf of prayerfulness in 2019. Maybe a, a sermon about the community. How we've got to love each other better in 2019. The, the months. A sermon about New Year's resolutions. Maybe that's what you're expecting. Well, get this. You're getting no such thing at all uh, this morning. And I will tell you plainly why. For each of us gathered in the room, every single one, from young to old, in 2019, our greatest need is exactly the same. For all of us in here, this year, our primary need is to know more of our God. To know more, to grow in understanding of and relationship with the one true creator, almighty God. So this morning... Guess what? No New Year's resolutions. Let's kick off the year turning to Exodus 34 to where, did you notice, to where your God is described. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of us in here, if we put our thinking caps on, we are probably familiar with the setting. Are we? The setting of Exodus 34, we know, don't we, that here most... uh, uh, Moses is called up to Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, but to receive them for the second time. And even the boys and girls, they know, don't they, the boys and girls in here? You know what happened to the first set of the Ten Commandments, do you? Moses comes down from Sinai. What does he find, boys and girls? He finds the people worshipping an idol, the golden calf, And Moses, in a fit of fury, what does he do? He smashes, doesn't he? Smashes the tablets on the ground. And here, Moses is going up Sinai again to receive from God a second time to receive the Ten Commandments, right? So we get the setting. We all notice that. But I wonder if you've got your finger on the pulse today, maybe you notice something else. Did you hear what we read in verse 5? It is truly staggering that as Moses goes up the mountain, we read, not only does God descend, (laughs) listen to this, we read that God here proclaims his name. (laughs) Come on, mull it over. Just think about it. Isn't it stunning? Do you see what we're about to, to, to experience and face in Exodus 34, do you see what's about to happen? God himself is about to preach. Isn't that something? And he is about to preach about himself. In these very words that we're about to get to here, God is about to reveal to us his nature. He's about to speak of himself, his character, his attributes, what our God is like. So I don't know about you. I'm excited to look at this this morning. Aren't you a little bit enthused. I mean, I, I, I know, like, in a sense, it's, it, it's intimidating, isn't it? A little bit. I mean, in J- Exodus 34, we really are on holy ground as we ascend. Sinai, but aren't you enthused, enthused to behold your God? And so if you have Exodus 34 open in front of you, the first thing, the title, the first heading is really simple We see here what our God is like. What our God is like. Um, Now, if you're looking down, you can see that in verse 6, things get real (laughs) very, very quickly in this portion of Scripture. Don't they, in verse 6? What God does after repeating his name um, for emphasis, the Lord, the Lord, after he does that, God begins to describe himself and his nature and his character and his heart. And he uses five separate attributes, five different attributes to describe his heart, his nature. So how don't, why, why don't we play it like this? Let's do a little Pied Piper thing here. 
where I will very briefly play through the five attributes and you, you, you follow along. Let's do it like that. The five attributes that God uses to describe himself. Now, is this true or not? That some words in the English language, they kind of lose their bite and they lose their punch because of overuse. Is that true, do you think? Some words in the English language, they almost use their significance because they're used all the time. I, I'm going to go for the obvious example for you, okay? The example of the word literally. Like literally used to mean something, didn't it? To the younger people in here, it did used to mean something. It used to mean in a literal sense. But now what's happened through incredible overuse, it's, nearly, it's used in nearly every single sentence, isn't it, at the moment? Through overuse, what's happened? It, the meaning's kind of been diluted, hasn't it? It's just used for emphasis. Now, the word through overuse has become a little bit stale. Now, I think we all agree with that. Do we agree with this? That the same could almost, with reverence, could almost be said of the very first attribute you've got of God in verse 6. What does God say? Do you see it? Now, he describes himself as being merciful. And don't you agree that because we use that all the time, don't we? Isn't that the default place for so many of us when we pray? Like we speak about God in a sort of an unthinking way. We pray or we speak about, oh, God's mercy. Now, because we overuse that term, isn't there a danger that the depths and the significance of this idea in front of you could easily, easily be lost? And so I want to say this, and I want you to hear it. At the very core of this idea of God's mercy, at the very heart, the very root of it, is this idea. It is idea of immense compassion. That's what's in front of you. God speaking about his pitying of others. Immense compassion. I don't know about you, but I think that is just marvelous. You see what's happening? In direct contrast to the way that our world thinks about him. What's the first thing that God wants us to know? What is the very first thing that God says to us in Exodus 30? What does he say? He says that he cares. First thing. He cares for man. He cares for us in here. He cares for London City Presbyterian Church. Intense compassion, yes. But he, our God, cares for you. But then read on with me, come on. What's the next one? We see that God is also gracious. I think if we, again, if we work together, I think we could come up with a working definition of that idea. Could we, do you think? If you were put on the spot, tea and coffee after the service, put on the spot and had to define the word grace, I think we could do a pretty decent job of it amongst us. Could we, grace, what would you say? What would you go for for grace? You'd maybe say unmerited favor that God shows. That sort of idea, yeah? Undeserved blessing that God, yes? That sort of idea, grace. Well, for today's purposes, think of it like this, that God here is revealing to us that our God is a God who goes beyond what we could ever hope for as sinful people. That our God, by his nature, remember, his character, he is a God who goes, he goes above what you could ever expect of him. In fact, why don't you think about that scene in the book of Zechariah that we studied? Was it last year or the year before? Do you remember the scene where the people of Israel look at the completed temple for the very first time. They've been working on it for so long, haven't they? And the people of Israel see the complete attempt. Do you remember what they say when they see it? The people of Israel stand back from the complete attempt. What do they say? They say, better than we could ever have imagined. It is better than we could ever hope for. And you see the word that they use in Zechariah chapter 4. It's beautiful. It's the same root that God is saying here. Do you see it? It is part of our God's very nature, very character to go above, to go and beyond for you. And then 
when we hit the third attribute, I think we've got one that will pique the interest of the boys and the girls. Boys and girls, maybe your parents can help you with this. Can you see what the third attribute is? In verse 6, I think we're still in. Do you see what it is? Merciful, gracious. Then God says that he is slow to anger. Now, this is what you've got to realize, boys and girls. You're going to love this. That the idea there is of being long-nosed. Now, does that sound a little bit strange? Does it? With reverence? Your minister is telling you that God is describing himself as having, in a sense, a long nose. And maybe it's not just the boys and girls that are scratching their heads at this precise moment. Maybe we're all thinking that's... I want you to think about it like this, though. What seems to be happening is our God is contrasting himself with short-nosed animals, pigs, boars, that idea. The idea that God is saying, I am not like these animals that seem constantly to be snorting in frustration. These animals that seem to be constantly snorting in anger. No. What is our God like, friend? I mean, you consider your own sin this morning. Consider your own life. What do you know of your God? Your God is a God who is not like that. God is patient. Can't you testify to that as a Christian? God is long-suffering with us. He's forbearing. Ours is a God who is slow to anger. Then, do you know what happens? Do you know what happens? We get to one for the parents in here. uh, Because mums and dads, is this not true? That even if we like to think of ourselves, mums and dads and grannies and grandpas as well, if we like to think of ourselves as a, even if we like to think of ourselves as incredibly caring, the love that we have for other people's children in no way compares to the love that we have for our own offspring. Now, isn't that right, mums and dads? We might not like to confess that. We might not like to think about it. But we love our nieces and nephews, right? You know, they're great. We, we do. We love our friends, children. They're great. We do, we do love them. But the love that we have for our own children is it's on a different level right? Hopefully the mums and dads can say that uh, this morning. Now you have to bear that in mind because isn't this true that the attributes that we have just looked at, they could all be said of God's relationship with mankind. Isn't that right? Like think what we looked at mercy. God is merciful to all that he has made. Grace Yes, God is, there's common grace that God shows to all humanity. What about the third? What was the third one? Slow to anger. Now, you think about the city you're living in just now. It is steeped in rebellion and it hates God. And God is slow to anger. Do you see what I'm saying to you? These attributes thus far can be, can be said of God's relationship to all of mankind. Now, I ask you to do this. Look at the fourth attribute. Oh, it changes people. Look at it. Do you see that God reveals himself to be abounding in what? Steadfast love. And friends, what you have to understand is that God has been much more particular, much more specific. The idea there is about covenant care. That's what God is talking. He's talking about covenant love. Do you see the idea? Yes, God maintains a care and a love for for all of humanity. do Do you see what we're seeing? That this God is saying, I have a specific love for my covenant community. God's saying, I abound in love for who? For my own children. You see, that the love that God has for you, that's the love that God says is abounding and overflows. I think if we had longer, of course, we could delve into the fifth attribute. Do you see that? Follow along with me. Again, overflowing. Again, overflowing is God's faithfulness, the idea that he can, you can, friend, rely upon him because of the veracity and the truth of his word. If we had more time, we could focus on that. But instead, I want you to hear this, and I want you to listen good to this from Reverend Perkins' reading earlier on, chapter 33. I think you and I can deduce the reason that God unveils his character at this precise moment. I wonder if you can 
do the math and put the pieces of the jigsaw together. Why does God choose right now, Exodus 34, to reveal in such a staggering way his attributes and his character? Do you see the answer? It it is to inspire his people on for that imminent journey to the promised land. God communicates his heart to his people. He says, this is what I'm like to spur them on in their journey. And so this is my appeal to you as a congregation that you might take even this week this description of God and use it for the purpose that it is intended. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe even later this afternoon, maybe tonight after church, maybe this week you come back to this description, these five attributes, and you pour over it. I mean, you pray over it. Why? That you might worship God more? Yes. That you might praise him? Yes. But that you, Christian friend, might be reinvigorated in 2019 for the long walk that you've got ahead of you, that you pour over this for your long walk home. We see what God is like. But then secondly, and much, much more briefly, we see next how our God acts. So we've seen what he's like in his five attributes. Now, how our God acts. Over uh, Christmas, over the festive period, I've been reading a couple of different books. Uh, I've just completed a book by a woman called Rosaria Butterfield. Have you heard of Rosaria Butterfield? Butterfield. A few of you are nodding your heads and smiling. So I assume that you have. It was a good book. It was a book I know some of you have read. It was a book about uh, Christian hospitality. About hospitality and the Christian It was a good book. It was a challenging book. But I think the real winner of the book was the author herself. I mean, you're reading this book and you're just constantly amazed at this woman. I mean, she comes across as just being the most amazing, uh, gracious Christian woman. You know, she comes across as being so generous and loving, sacrificial. Do you know what? She comes across as being incredibly Christ-like in her behavior. Now, here's the thing. From that loving character in Rosaria Butterfield, this beautiful heart, this caring heart, it seems to be that Rosaria Butterfield tends to act in a couple of different ways. Now, I'll I'll show you what I mean. Like when Rosaria Butterfield encounters somebody in real problems, let's say one of her neighbors is having a falling out with her husband or somebody at church is going through hardship. What Rosaria Butterfield does is act in one of two ways. What she does is she will either... Uh, give that person a room for the night. You know, she'll, she'll give, oh, come and come in the house. I'll give you a bit, you know, peace and quiet and some safety. She'll either do that or, so this is the other way she works, she will provide a meal for that person. Just come in and rest and eat. Now, you following me just now? Out of her loving heart, she tends, she's almost compelled by her nature to act in a couple of different directions. And if that's true for Rosaria Butterfield, I think in Exodus 34, it is also true of the God that we worship. Do you see what I'm saying? That God has revealed his character, something of his character to us. But as this section goes on, what he does is he tells you how, therefore, he acts. So he tells tells us of actions that he takes, actions that kind of flow out of this glorious and beautiful character of God. Now, I said two Rosaria Butterfield actions. I just want to draw your attention to two from God. So check for the first one, check out about halfway through verse seven. How does your God act? Look at about halfway through verse seven. If you're looking there, do you see the words, God will by no means? Do you see those words? So because of his nature, God says to you that he will by no means clear the guilty. Now think of that for a moment. Consistent with the character of your God is a desire to judge and judge evil and sin. Consistent with his nature is a desire to punish evil and sin. So you have that. 
Now, now, maybe is there a problem we have to deal with here? Like if you read on in that verse, maybe there is a problem. Read it with me. You, you tell me if, if you find this problematic about God. We're told that he doesn't clear the guilty. Now look at the next bit. God visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children. And the children's children to the third, fourth generation. So, so am I, am I, do some of us have a problem with that? God visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Are we thinking that doesn't, actually, Andy, that does not sound fair at all. It, doesn't, it sounds, though, you may be thinking that God punishes one generation, the children, for the sins of another. Are we thinking like that? Come on, friends. Are we? Are we? Let me tell you, it's not like that at all. In the parallel passage in Exodus 20, what we hear is that the children in view there are also steeped in sin. That the children there are also filled with hatred to God. So I want you to be clear on this. The idea here is not that God punishes one set of people for the sins of another. That is not your God. That is not your God. The idea here is that each generation, each generation will be met with equal justice by God. Not that God will let one generation off scot-free because he punished their forefathers. No, that it flows from God's very heart, a desire to be consistent in judging sin. So he judges, he judges sin. But I said, like Rosaria Butterfield... I said two actions that flow from God's heart. And I just want to pause to ensure that you're with me here. Are you? I'll tell you why I want to ensure that you're with me and listening to me just now. Because I think, honestly, that the second action that God promises to take here is quite simply the greatest piece of news that mankind has ever heard It's quite a statement, isn't it? That in front of you, you have the greatest bit of news that humanity has ever, ever been exposed to. Do you see it in verse 7? Isn't it lovely? Look at verse 7. We are told that it flows from the very heart of God to, look at the words, to forgive sinners. I think the Christians in here know that is the greatest bit of news that humanity has ever heard. It is flowing from the heart of God, from the character of God to pardon sin, to pardon, to pardon iniquity and wickedness in sinners. Now, we could, couldn't we, focus on how that forgiveness comes about. I mean, the rest of the Bible makes it clear that repentance is key. Now, listen to me. It is not natural to God to forgive sinners, but it is natural to God to forgive repentant sinners, contrite sinners, and we could focus on that, couldn't we? But I do not want to. Instead, I need to apply this, and I need to take this and bring it to your door this morning. And I need to ask you this. Where are you, friend, today, spiritually? You've entered in a new year. I know what this is like. Don't we take stock at New Year? We do. I do. You do. We analyze our situation. So I ask you this morning, where are you spiritually today? I mean, are you a Christian this morning who is really and truly losing sight of the gospel? Is that it? I mean, this morning, is it really the case for you that you are utterly burdened by your sin? And the guilt of the sin and the shame of it is just weighing you down and losing sight of what's true for you in Christ. Is that you? Or this morning, is it different for you? Is it the case that you have become, begun 2019 in condemnation? Like, is it the truth that you are not a Christian in here this morning, not believing in Christ? You're sitting in here, but you are thinking like this, that your sin is too much for God, too great for God to deal with. If you meet either of those criteria, aren't you stunned by the sheer extent of the forgiveness that God says is natural to him? Because look at verse 7. Look at the extent of what God says. Does he say to you that he forgives iniquity? Does he? Look at verse 7. Does he say that? Yeah, but read on. 
Transgression is also mentioned. Do you see? Read on. Sin is also mentioned. Do you see the point? All three Hebrew words for wickedness are used. All three Hebrew words. For, do you see it? Friend, are you thinking your sin is too great for God? You, you're thinking there's no way God can forgive me. Your sin is too habitual. It's too great. These thoughts, and these actions, these words that you use. I can stand and I can assure you because of the nature and the heart of God that your sin can be forgiven. Do you hear me? Your sin can be forgiven. If we bow, if we repent to God, it flows out of our creator's very nature. Praise him for this. It flows out of his very nature to pardon our trespasses, and to pardon our sins. And if we see what God is like, and if we see how he acts, we also very briefly have to consider through whom our God works. Because I know there's a lot here. There is a lot in Exodus 34, right? But if, if you to use an Americanism, if you're tracking with me, then isn't it the case that there's a logical problem here? Isn't there an ethical, moral conundrum at this point? I wonder if you recognize what that is. Reverend Perkins read Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, God says that this revelation that we're dealing with here is a revelation. This is what God says. He says it is a revelation of his goodness, his justice, and his perfection. That's what we're dealing with. God says, this is a revelation of my goodness. That's God's claim. And then on the other hand, what have I just said? That this God pardons evil people. Like, do you see, come on, do you see the conundrum? Like, I mean, are we not sort of sitting here thinking, well, that means God must be ethically compromised, doesn't it? Doesn't it? If he's claiming on one hand to be good and just, and the other, he's, 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 he's pardoning wickedness and pardoning evil. Isn't there an issue here? Well, there's something very important to, to grasp. If, uh, it's quite frustrating for me, I think. If we were to take a longer run up at this section of scripture, and if we had been in a sermon series in Exodus, then right now there would be in the forefront of our thinking, there would be one of the main themes of this section of scripture. Now, I want you to understand that from Exodus 32 to Exodus 34, one of the primary themes, maybe even the foremost theme, is the importance and the role of a mediator before God. And you can see that, right? I mean, who's God speaking to here? He's not speaking to the people there at the bottom of Sinai. He's speaking to their representative, their mediator, Moses. Now, you understand with me, you track with me, that that is an important theme here, the role of the mediator. So if that's true, surely we have to just at least look at what the mediator does in response to this revelation from God. So would you look at verse 9 with me? Boys and girls too, have a look at verse 9. What does the mediator do? First we see that the mediator identifies with the people's sin. Look at the end of the verse, verse 9. Look at the end of the verse. So odd in a way. Look, look how Moses speaks. He, he, he speaks of, he says, pardon whose sin? Our sin. You notice that? Pardon our, do you see why that's weird and strange? Like, everything here is about the golden calf. Everything is about the idolatry. Where was Moses? Moses was up the mountain. Moses was not involved in the idolatry and that iniquity. And yet, do you see what he's identifying himself with the people's sin? You have this, in a sense, guiltless, this innocent mediator. And what is he doing? He's identifying with the people's sin. Then, notice also what he does. He implores God to deal with his people representatively. Do you see what I mean by that? I wonder, like, think about it. God was filled with 
anger for these people. I mean, he just filled with fury as they worshiped the golden calf. But you know, I know it was different with Moses. Did you notice the terminology in Harrison's reading? God speaks about Moses being his friend. He meets with Moses face to face in the temple, the tent of meeting. And now look at the start of this verse, verse 9. Look what Moses says. He says, he brings that favor right back to God. and says, God, if you favor me, please, God, deal with the people through that favor. If you favor me, if I really am your friend, use that towards the people. Do you see? And then the third one is obvious. He's interceding. He's up this mountain. And what is Moses doing? Pleading with God. God, save these people. Save them. Save them from the judgment that they deserve. And maybe this morning in LCPC, maybe you know exactly what your minister is about to say. Maybe you know exactly what's going to come out of my mouth now. But listen anyway. As we consider this theme, do we not have the answer to our great ethical, moral question about our God? I turn it over to you, Christian friends. How can God maintain his goodness and at the same time forgive your sin? How can that happen? What would you say? You would say, all because of the great mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has provided for you. Isn't that what you would say back to me? All because of the mediator, all because of him. And friend, what has your mediator done for you? You know the answer, don't you? He has represented you on the hill, on the hill of Calvary. And he is identified with your sin, hasn't he? In his incarnation, in his baptism, the truly guiltless mediator, the truly innocent one, identifying with wretches like you and me. And then what has he done? He has enabled our God to deal with us representatively. You must, as a Christian, know that your sin had to be punished. Your sin has had to be dealt with and punished. And what has your mediator done for you? He has gladly taken it upon himself. He has welcomed that punishment onto himself in his body on the tree. Why? That God might now deal with you with the favor he reserved for the mediator. And then what is the crowning glory of it all? That as I speak to you in this room, your mediator in the hill of heaven. He intercedes for you just now. He intercedes for you, ensuring that salvation is applied to you evermore. That is the supreme work of the mediator. Friends, you surely see from this portion of scripture, do you, what our response must be? I mean, look at verse eight. What does Moses do? He shows us that the only fitting action if faced with the presence of God is to bow to the ground quickly and worship. Surely you and I should do the same. Friends, we know that wherever we go, wherever we go this year, as Christians with the Holy Spirit indwelling our heart, we know that we go with the presence of God. So maybe we already see the application of the sermon, do we? And maybe there is a New Year's resolution for you after all. Friends, no matter where this year takes you, no matter what the next 12 months hold, surely in light of the glory of God and what he's done for us, that at every single turn we seek to bring him glory, we fall to the ground and we worship and praise our God. As your minister, I hope this year brings you great joy. Of course I do. I really do. But above all, I hope this year brings you joy in Christ Jesus, that every single one of us in here might, over the next 12 months, know more of the one true and living God. Let's pray.